Hi there, Chris here with Road City Originals. Well, it's springtime, which means summer's right around the corner, and that means it's picnic season. So today, we're going to be making a picnic blanket with a water-resistant backing, so that when you lay it down on the grass, if it's a little damp, it's not going to soak through and ruin your dinner. For today's project, we're going to be using one roll of two and a half inch pre-cut strips. For the backing, we'll be using some ripstop water-resistant nylon. And to make it nice and portable, we'll be using some one inch nylon webbing and some one inch buckles. And then when we quilt it, we're going to want to use 100% polyester batting to help with that water resistance. So for the pattern, we're going to be doing a simple log cabin and there'll be a free download for that. To get started, we're going to want to take our two and a half inch strips and separate them into light and dark. We're going to need 18 dark and 18 light, and then one strip for the center of each log cabin. For that center strip, you can choose one out of the bundle, or you can choose an orphan strip that you have from another project. So I will just start by taking the ones that are obviously on the dark side and obviously on the light side and putting them into piles. The ones that are somewhere in the middle, I will leave set aside for now and compare them to the other colors when we get towards the end. Again, we're going to need 18 light and 18 dark. Fourteen, four, six, eight, 12, 14, 16. So I'll add these to my dark. Two, four, Six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. And then I'm going to go with this bright orange for the center. Now that we have them separated into dark, light, and our centers, we can start cutting them. So I'm going to start with the darks first. And the pattern has all of the dimensions that you need to cut everything to. So for the dark pieces, Half of them will be cut one way and half of them will be cut another. This particular strip set has two of each print. So I am just going to separate them into two separate piles. And you do want to unfold them. Put those aside. And these nine strips will all get cut the same. But I only want to cut probably four at a time. I don't like to stack them up too high. But as long as you have a nice sharp rotary blade, you should be able to cut between two and four layers pretty easily. This pattern does make very efficient use of the two and a half inch strips. So we want to cut our selvage off, but we want to not cut off too terribly much. So I'm going to cut right along the print line. And then I will line this up with my mat. Our first cut will be 18 and a half inches. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, So this is piece J. Set those aside. Next we need 14 and a half. This is piece H. And then six and a half. And two and a half. So now I'll just continue cutting the other set of strips this way. A total of nine strips will be cut in this configuration. And then the other nine will be slightly different. The pattern has all of the details, as well as a finished chart. When you're done cutting, this is everything you should have. All right, the first nine are cut. So now for the second set of nine. Four. 
For this set, we're going to start out with 14 and a half inches. And then two ten and a half inches. And six and a half inches. All right, all of the dark pieces are cut, so we'll set these aside and cut the light pieces. Now, all 18 of the light colored strips will be cut exactly the same. So I will just start layering them up and cutting them. So for all 18 of the light fabrics, we are going to start with a 16 and a half inch piece. A 12 and a half inch piece. Eight and a half inches. And four and a half inches. Now all of the light pieces are cut. So the last strip to cut is for the centers. And this will need to be cut into 18 two and a half inch squares. So we can leave this folded in half. In fact, we can fold it again just to make it a little bit faster. So now we're cutting through four layers of fabric. So there's four, eight, we only need nine of these. There will be nine blocks. These are the nine centers. Everything's cut so we can head over to the sewing machine. I will be chain piecing these just to make this a nice quick project. And the instructions walk you through step by step how to assemble your log cabin, but all of piece A will get joined with a piece B. So I'm going to join all of these together, then we'll add on a piece C on two sides, and then piece D, E, and we'll work our way around until we get a log cabin. So let's head over to the sewing machine. So we're going to start by sewing each of the center squares, which is piece A to one piece B. This pattern is intended to be scrappy, so I'm just mixing up my piles of dark and light so that I get a good mix in each block. And now we're going to press all of these with the seam facing piece B. Now with the center square facing down, we are going to sew a piece B to the right hand side of this unit. And with each new piece that we add on, we're going to press the seam towards that new piece. Now on these units, we're going to sew the other piece B to the right hand side.
So here we have pieces A, B, and C. If we rotate this, now we're going to add a piece D. We will always be adding to the right hand side. And we are just going to keep going around until we have an 18 and a half inch log cabin block. All right, I have all nine of the quilt blocks sewn together. So now we are going to sew them in three rows of three. For my layout, I am going to keep all of the dark side in the bottom corner and all of the light side in the top corner. So I'm not going to worry too much about which block is where but I'm just going to make sure that the lower left is where the dark corner is. So we'll simply sew them together, creating three rows, and then we'll sew those rows together. All right, I have sewn my three rows, and now I need to press the seams. On the top and the bottom row, we're going to press the seams to the left, and on the middle row, we're gonna press the seams to the right. That way, when we sew the rows together, those seams will nest. Here we can see the seam going to the left, to the right, and to the left again. So those will all nest nicely. So we'll take this back to the machine and join our three rows together. Now that the rows are joined, we just need to press those long seams and you can press them in either direction. It does not matter. Well, the quilt top is all ready to go. I have my backing prepared, so let's get it loaded onto my Cunic 16X Elite, and we're gonna use the Quilter's Creative Touch automation to get this quilted. So, all right, I have my nylon backing already loaded, and I've basted down my batting. Now I'm gonna base down the quilt top. And now that it's all basted down, in my Quilter's Creative Touch software, I can program in the dimensions of the quilt and pick my pantograph. Today I will be using Quilter's Creative Touch 6, the pro version, and I'm just doing an edge-to-edge -edge pantograph. First we need to set our safe area, and now we'll put in the actual height and width of the quilt, which is 54 inches by 54 inches, and now we can select our pattern. 
I want something that's not too dense because I do want to limit the number of puncture holes through the nylon just to help keep that water resistant quality of it. But then I also want something fun and summery to go with the prints of the front. So I'm going to choose this butterfly edge to edge print. And by default, it is about four inches tall. I am going to make that slightly taller. So this gives me a good visualization of the quilt and how large the pattern is going to be. So I think that looks pretty good. Now I'm going to sew this in zones. I like to use four point placement just to help me as I advance the quilt, keep everything lined up. So we're going to move and mark our upper left and upper right corners to place this pattern. So I have the needle just over the very top left corner of the quilt. So I will touch that. Now over the top right corner. And I'm going to keep the lock height on, but the lock width is off. So as there's any variation off of 54 inches, it will just adjust so that everything looks nice when it's quilted. We'll move back over to the left hand side because this is our starting point right here. I don't have any thread breaks, so I don't need to optimize at this point, but I do need to pull my bobbin. And now we can start sewing. And now we can advance the quilt and keep on going. A trick I've learned for marking your placement is to use just some painter's tape or sticky dots and do a single stitch. So you can use the hole in the tape to line up your next row. I always like to baste down the edges before I start the next section. Now we'll do the other side. Now we can use those bits of tape to hover right over that puncture mark 
to place the next row. And now we're ready to trim this up, put on the binding. To trim your quilt, the easiest thing I have found is just a large square ruler and a nice sharp rotary cutter. I prefer the 60 millimeter when trimming quilts just because you have more layers you're going through. Seems to be a little easier. I don't worry too much about everything being all perfectly straight and square at this point. One thing you can do though, because we have this seam going pretty much the entire perimeter, you can use that to measure off of. I'm going to be measuring two inches, so I will be trimming off a little bit of fabric, but that will help it look more square in the end.
just as binding. Now, depending on your set of pre-cut strips, you may have enough left over to do the binding. You will need a total of six two and a half by width of fabric strips. I only had three left for mine, so I grabbed three more out of my scrap bin that I think go well with the colors, so it'll blend in, but still be kind of scrappy. If you like, you can cut six two and a half inch strips from yardage if you want your binding to be all the same all the way around. So now I'm going to join these together with a 45 degree angle end to end so that I have one long binding strip and then I'll attach it to the quilt. So to join my strips at a 45 degree angle, I'll lay one strip down and then lay the next strip at a 90 degree angle. And then we're going to sew from this little point here to this little point here. And now I'll take this strip, make sure that it is right side up, and add the next strip onto it and do the same. And now we'll trim these apart and trim off that excess down to about a quarter of an inch. And then we're going to press these seams open to help reduce bulk in the binding. So I'm going to go do that now. Now, as I'm pressing my binding, I like to roll it onto a spool to keep it organized while I'm attaching it to the quilt. And this is just an empty thread spool from Finesse Thread, and I find it's the perfect size for this. I don't typically fold my binding in half lengthwise as I'm pressing it, because I find that as I'm attaching it to the quilt and then pressing it back, it's going to get pressed in half one way or another. So I can save that step up front and just do it later. So to get it started on the thread spool, some painter's tape is your best friend. Just wrap that around and then start wrapping in your binding. If there are any major wrinkles or creases, you can press those out as you go. And then as we get to those seams, you can finger press them open first and then hit them with an iron. Now we're ready to attach this to the quilt. So for this quilt, I'm going to attach the binding to the back side first and then flip it around and tack it down on the front. I have my walking foot installed to help me out. And we are going to start by folding our binding in half lengthwise and leaving probably a 10 or 12 inch tail here. And then sew it on with a standard quarter inch seam allowance. Now, when I approach the corner of the quilt, I'm going to stop shy a quarter of an inch and then pivot and sew off the corner. Now, to make sure that there's enough fabric for me to turn this over to the other side, what you'll need to do is actually take that binding and fold it back so that the raw edge of the binding and the raw edge of the quilt are parallel. Just give that a little finger press. And then you're going to fold it onto the quilt. Now, before you start sewing, what you should check is that this fold lines up right with the edge of the quilt. And these two folds are in line as well. So that is what it should look like. Then you can take it back to the needle. I like to back tack at the edge and then just start sewing the next side. Now as we approach the spot where we started sewing, we're going to want to leave about an eight inch gap between where we're ending the tail and where we started sewing. I like to do a couple little back tacks. And now we need to join our two ends. So here's where we ended and here's where we started. So take that starting tail and you want to trim it about halfway in this gap, which is about right here. And to get a nice 90 degree cut, what you can do is fold it back on itself, 
line up all those raw edges. And then insert your scissors and snip. And that'll give you a nice 90 degree cut. Now don't throw away that scrap. We're gonna use that as our measurement tool. So you'll take that scrap you just cut off, align one of the ends. This is the two and a half inch width right here, but align that raw edge with the cut you just made. And then take your ending tail and lay it on top. And we're gonna fold it back so it lines up with the bottom edge of that scrap. Just like that. Insert our scissors and snip. To join the two ends, we're gonna take our starting tail and open it up so that it is right side up. On our ending tail, we're gonna open it up so it's right side down. And we're gonna join those at a 45 degree angle. Depending on your quilt, you can bunch up the actual quilt part here and either put a pin or a clip in it just to give you a little bit more leeway on your strips. So we have our starting tail right side up, our ending tail right side down, and we're going to line those up with each other at a 90 degree angle. I'm not big on pinning, but for this, I always pin just to keep those pieces right where I need them. And we're going to be sewing from corner to corner parallel to the quilt. So if you have your quilt going this way, that's where we're going to sew. We'll take our pins out and before we trim that seam allowance, we'll open up the quilt to make sure it all lays flat. There's no twists or anything like that. And this looks good. So I will go ahead and trim that seam allowance to about a quarter of an inch and then finger press it open. And now we can continue sewing that down. Now we're going to take this to the iron and press it back. So now we're going to go all the way around the quilt from the backside and press the binding out. Now because this backing is that nylon fabric, you'll want to test and make sure and probably turn your iron down to a medium so that you don't melt that fabric. Because your iron is going to be a little bit cooler, you might not get as crisp a line, but it should still be fine. All right, now that we've gone all the way around, we're going to flip our quilt over. And you can just take this back to the machine and fold it over as you go. But I prefer to glue baste my binding in place and I just use regular Elmer school glue. I have a precision tip on the bottle here so I don't over glue anything. Fold this over so it goes just past that stitching line that you can see. And then you press it in place to dry that glue so that nothing will gum up on your machine. I also like the glue basting so that I can play around with my corners to make sure that it is a nice, perfect miter before it gets stitched in place. This glue is meant to be temporary, so you don't need a whole lot because it's just to hold it in place until you stitch it down. Now we're ready to go back to the sewing machine and we're going to sew just inside that edge to tack all of the binding down. Now you will see the stitches both on the front side and on the back side. And on the back side, it might not hit right in that ditch and that's okay. So I'm going to use a yellow thread in my bobbin and probably a pink or an orange on top. So here I have just my multi-purpose foot installed on my machine. I like it because it has kind of an open toe there so I can see a little bit better. I'm just going to top stitch right along this edge about an eighth of an inch to secure that down. Technically at this point you could have a finished quilt, but we're going to go a step further and add a convenient carrying handle and some straps to keep it rolled up while you're transporting it to your picnic site. For that you are going to need two plastic buckles and a length of webbing. Now this is one inch webbing and these are designed to go on one inch webbing. They're one inch buckles. And we need to cut our webbing at least 52 inches long, probably closer to 56 inches long. Anywhere in that range should work. It is also handy to have a lighter nearby so that you can singe the edges just to help prevent fraying. Cutting the cording is really easy. Once you have it measured out, you can either use scissors or just your regular rotary cutter to give it a quick cut. So when you have a raw edge, it can fray pretty easily. So you just take your lighter and run it really quick over that a few times. 
and it melts it just enough to keep it from fraying. To attach it to the quilt, we'll need to find the center of one edge. So just pick any edge and fold your quilt in half to find the center. Then we'll need to measure four inches in from that fold on both sides of the quilt and put a pin in it. Just like that. To prepare your straps, you'll need to take one end of the buckle. And I just took both of the female ends of the buckle and we're gonna feed it through on each end so the buckles are facing in opposite directions, just like that. And now from this end, we're going to measure 20 inches and then place that buckle right at the 20 inch mark, just like that. To keep it from moving, we can put a pin through it here and we're gonna do the same on the other side. So you should have something that looks like this. That will bring over the quilt and we have those eight inches marked right there. And we're going to line these up so they are just on the inside of those eight inch marks. You will want about an inch to an inch and a half from the fold where the buckle is to where we're going to stitch. So I'm gonna go ahead and make sure that's lined up with the pin. And these measurements do not have to be exact. So depending on how long you cut your straps, you can kind of play around with it what you think will work best for you, but you do want them to be about eight inches apart. Make sure they're about even and then pin this one in place. We can take out these marking pins for now. And now we'll take this over to the sewing machine and just do a couple back and forth stitches right there to secure this in place. Now I do still have my binding thread in the machine. You can change it off for black if you like. I do want to keep yellow on the back side so that it matches the stitching of the quilting that I did. We'll take that pin out so we don't sew over it. Just hold this in place. And I'm going to stitch back and forth a few times to make sure it's really secure. If you like, you can also sew a box here to make sure it's extra secure. Now we'll do the other one. All right, we now have a handle and half the straps ready to go. Now for the other side of the buckle, we'll be putting on the male end and with it lying flat against the back of the quilt, we wanna feed it up through the first hole and then down through the second. So it looks like that. So the strap is flat against the back of the quilt comes up and then down through the male end without having to twist it. That way, once you have it buckled, you can pull it tight if needed. Now, if you cinched this edge, you can just leave it like that. I'm going to hem it though. So I'm gonna fold it over about a half of an inch and then fold it again, and then just stitch a straight line through that. Now this does get pretty thick, but it's a pretty loose weave on webbing, so it's not too difficult to sew through. So one is done, we'll do the same on the other. So again, we're gonna feed it up through this high notch right there, and then down through the lower notch, so that when you pull on it, it gives resistance and doesn't slip out. We wanna make sure it lies flat against the back of the quilt, and we'll fold this under, fold it under again, give that some stitches. So this not only finishes that raw edge, but it also will help prevent your buckle from accidentally sliding off. And now that that strap is attached, let me show you how to fold this up. So from the right side, you can fold in each side so that it meets where that first block ends. So this is the row between all the blocks and you can just fold it so that meets on both sides and then fold that in so it goes just past the buckle. So it should look like this. You can see the buckles right there with a couple inches on each side. Then from the edge without the buckles, we'll just start rolling it up like a sleeping bag. It doesn't have to be perfect. Now we can take those straps, wrap it around the quilt and buckle it shut. And there you go, a handy little picnic blanket you can throw in your trunk, and it's easy to transport to and from your picnic site when you have your hands full with your food. If you like this project, be sure to follow me on social media. I can be found on all the social media platforms at Rose City Originals. I'll have a free download for this project and some others over on my website, rosecityoriginals.com. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching.